Amen. Thank you, Pastor Cass. Please take your seats. Great to be with you. If you're a guest in the building today, if you're watching online, then uh, it's going to be a great time. And it is week three of our series called Stay Salt, where we're looking at showing and sharing the message of Jesus with our world. We believe that that is a good thing. And uh, we're talking about staying salty, staying salty. Everyone say salty. 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 I just want to settle something right now about, about the best chips that you can get. Because some people out there seem to think that McDonald's fries are the best. And uh, there's a lot of old school people out there who, who seem to have preference for the KFC, the Colonel's chips. There's something about the, the spice mix in the chips. There are a few nods. Well, I, can, you, I just respectfully want to say that you're both wrong. It is Hungry Jack's thick cut, fr- thick cut chips. It is, no, it's actually been tested. It's been voted up upon within my family. My kids agree with me that the Hungry Jack's chips always have the, the most ch- chicken salt. They're always the saltiest. They're always the best. So like, I, I, I don't, I've got the microphone, so you, bad luck. They are the, go after church today, get your chips from church. They're good too. But then go and test me on that. They are the best. They are the saltiest. They're the saltiest chips. And of course, we are talking about salt. And, and the thing after, so I'll get my Hungry Jack's chips. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get the Hungry Jack's chips. My kids will be happy. And here's the thing, right, is that after you've, you have the, the chips, the fact that you're like, I love it because it's so tasty, but then it's like the voice from the back will be like, Dad, I need a drink. I need a drink. It's because they're so salty. Is that like the, the very thing you want straight after is you need a drink. And this is what this, this series is all about, being salt. And in Matthew 5, it says, you, you, not the person next to you, not just the person next to you, not just who are you, you sitting right there, you are the salt of the earth. And, and there's, there's many implications of that. It has the preserving nature, it brings out the flavours. But the other thing that salt does is that it makes you thirsty. It makes you thirsty. And my first point for today, I'm just gonna move through it nice and quick today so we can get out of here early, amen. My first point for those taking notes is that we are meant to make people thirsty. We are meant to leave something with people that they think, wow, I, I need something else in my life. I need God in my life. Can someone just fix this, make a note? I'm gonna trip on that today. Praise God. Work health safety. Um, I feel like I wanna keep talking about Hungry Jacks, but I've gotta move on. Someone tell me I've gotta move on. Let's read the scripture together, praise God. We're called to make people thirsty. Matthew 5 says this, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost, it's flavour? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And then it goes on to say this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed up on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. So we, we, we've got two pictures. We've got salt and we've got light, but it's all about the same thing. And, it, and it's talking about not hiding it, not denying it, but putting it out there in a way that it's gonna have an effect beyond yourself. It's gonna have an effect for others. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to be salty. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're called to be salty. Just a little bit of seasoning, just, just give it to them. Just a little bit. You know, when I order chips from the fish and chip shop, I'm always getting extra chicken salt because I feel like that's the key. It doesn't cost you anything, just get it. Um, when, when <laughs> uh, my, my barber, um, I go to the, the same barber every time because um, I, I like having, he, he's someone who we have good conversation and he asks me, I, I've, got a, I've got an easy 
in terms of having conversations because people, people quickly get to the what do you do during the week. And so like, I'm a pastor, so we very quickly get on to um, church, God, Christianity, and you don't, you don't have that. So I'm lucky to have that. And so that comes up, uh, comes up regularly. And I'm having a conversation with my barber after one of our baptisms, and, and, he, and he, sort of, he, he sort of had a question for me. He said, a great question. He said, um, do, but good people, good people go to heaven, right? And, and then we had this, it opened up this wonderful conversation about the gospel and saying, no, it's not, it's not just good people that go to heaven. It's, it's forgiven people. It's people who have a reconciled relationship with God. There's gonna be people in heaven that you would not expect. People have done all sorts of things, but then they have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and that's made the difference for them. And, um, and then it was like, you could tell that it was like a complete shift of thinking about what, for him, what religion meant and the people that he knew and what, what, he, what came to mind for him when he, we thought of God and Christianity, he kind of flipped it on the head. He's like, wow. And then he said, he said the, the best thing that was so encouraging for me. He said, you really got me thinking. You really got me thinking. You could tell that he was kind of rattled by it. It was like, wow. And I'm like, that, for me, that was the biggest compliment. Like I didn't lead him to Christ there as he was you know, getting the razor on the back of my neck. But it's like the fact the fact that it, something in his, it, it opened him up to something and it changed his thinking. This is what we're talking about, being the salt, is that getting people thirsty and using our words and our actions to make an impression with people. And so the first thing, the first way, I wanna get practical, a little bit practical today. Um, the first practical area that we need to have salt is that we need to have salty speech. Say salty speech. Salty speech. Colossians 4, 6 says this, let your speech always be gracious. May there always be grace attached to what you're saying. Seasoned with what? Salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I love that. There's, in the way that we speak, there, it should actually point people towards something being different about us. It's, it's yes, how we show, uh, how we live our lives, but it's also how we speak. There should be something distinctive. And that's the Matthew 5 passage is saying, you are salt, you are light. There is something different about you because you know Jesus that people are gonna notice. Do you know, that's meant to come out in our speech. That people are gonna take notice. And, and what is it saying here that's meant to be noticeable about our speech? It's grace. There's meant to be grace. There's meant to be some, there's meant to be forgiveness. There's meant to be patience. There's meant to be, there's kindness because that's what God is like. And that's what He's done to us. And as people hear from us, as people hear the way that other people are talking and then they hear how we're responding, how we're meeting their perhaps aggro with kindness. They think, wow, there's salt in that conversation. There's salt in your words. There's something about that that's making me thirsty. You think, what is that? Oh, I need something. And I think there's one way we can do that is by asking questions. And I think, you think about Jesus' ministry, he was always asking questions. I love, I love that about Jesus because he, was, he had the salt thing going on. And he's like, if I can just do something, ask some questions, get them thinking about themselves, their faith and their life differently, then that will create an opening for me to be able to speak truth into. Um, one, of the, one of the questions, pre-prepared questions that I try and carry around um, on, on the forefront to throw in when there's an opportunity is one that I've found to be effective is, is this question. Because you might get people who are um, you know, on various levels of openness to Christianity, um, but finding a question that actually comes un, underneath that, this is the one, you can, you can borrow this one if you like. I, I find this, what do you find most appealing or convincing about Christianity? Because they don't, they don't have to believe to answer that question, but it gets them thinking about the nature of God, Jesus, and Christianity. And what are the positive aspects that you find convincing? Because it shows that there, do you know that atheists, agnostics, they have questions and doubts too? And so a question like that actually puts, highlights, hey, 
what you believe isn't watertight. In fact, probably what you believe, you haven't, haven't thought it through very well. There are those assumptions like Rachel talked about yesterday. And asking a question, what do you find convincing, compelling, beautiful about Christianity? And, and it'll get people thinking, oh, I found someone, I asked that question, someone said, that is a really good question. And then they gave me a fantastic answer that I'm like, wow, that opened up more. I'm like, wow, this person's actually much more open than what I thought. There's more under the surface than what I thought. See, it's salty. We need to have salty speech. So salt brings things to life, brings flavours to life. But salt, here's the other thing about salt, is it also purifies. Um, medically, saline, salty uh, liquid, is applied to wounds, applied to areas to, to uh, cleanse it and stop bacteria from growing there. And do you know that this is our, what our speech should be as well? That when there's a Christian present, when there is someone who knows the grace of God and the reality of Jesus, that there will be different words coming from their mouth that actually have a neutralising and a purifying effect to the conversations around them. And some, this is a real challenge for us in thinking, wow, what are the kind of words that are on my lips? Are they seasoned with salt? Am I speaking words that build up? Ephesians 4, 29 says this, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I love that. Don't let, any, don't let any, any. And I think, oh wow, as soon as I hear that word, any unwholesome talk, I, th- I think back to, oh yeah, wow, that, there was a little bit of gossip in what I said then. Oh, there was a little bit of negativity. Oh, there was a little bit of having a dig or there was a little bit of having a go or there was a little bit of grumbling and moaning and, and a bad attitude behind that. And he's saying, no, with you, be so careful with your speech. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only, you hear this, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Isn't that, isn't that so helpful? Isn't that so challenging? that our words and our speech needs to be salty. Um, I hear that, I'm, I'm challenged every time and I think we're all a work in progress on that, but I love that the Scripture gives us a prayer to pray. And I think we could pray this every day, the prayer from Psalm 141, it says this, Lord, set a guard over my mouth or set a filter over my mouth. Sometimes that's your spouse. Um, who's that filter for you? It just gives you, the, gives you the smack on the leg or the dig in the ribs. And you say, you shouldn't have said that. Tanya often will gl- be glaring at me. I'm like, why is she glaring at me? I must have said something really stupid. <laughs> Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Isn't that good? Isn't that a great prayer? That's my prayer today. We need to have salty speech. Number two, we need to not only have salty speech, but we need to have salty ears. And as the saying goes, there's a reason why the Lord has given us one mouth and two ears. I think we know that to be true, isn't it? James 1.9 says this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be what? Quick to listen. Quick to listen and comparatively <laughs> slow to speak. There's the, there's the two ears and the one mouth thing going on. Use the ears, have salty ears. And again, why, why are they salty? I mean, that is like pig's ears. You can eat pig's ears, can't you? If they, they, that, that is a delicacy. Oh, my dogs do. Um, they are quite salty. I love this quote. It says this. Uh, here, here's a quote about, about the need for us in our culture and in, when we're talking about evangelism, to be, to be listening, not just speaking. It says this, listening and hearing people out in a culture where people feel like they have to get their points out before they get cut off, can plough the ground for gospel conversation. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that helpful? And so often when we think about evangelism, we think about all the list of things, that the truths that we need to be able to get across so that they will believe. Because of course, that is a key believing truth is a key component of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But, it, but, it's, but it's also more than that. And, and part of, in order to, because we can, we can get things across, but it doesn't mean that there's communication taking place. 
Because we know that to communicate, there needs to be understanding, there needs to be listening, there need, there's the back and forth thing. And I think if we're just coming in with, hey, all this blah, 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 here's the things that, that the Bible says and here's the things you gotta learn. It's like, we're not, we're not listening, we're not sharing, we're not hearing what's going on in their life and then trying to find a way to speak truth specifically into that. And I think for many of us, even though we're well connected in our culture, and for some of us, we're actually too much like the culture around us. And that's the challenge for us. We need to be actually distinct from culture, the salt and light. But some of us actually need to understand what people, where, what, what do people value? What do they believe in? And I think the, way, the, the only way to find out is by listening to people. Ask, ask him, hey, what, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? What's important to you? Sitting down, have conversation, playing the long game, caring and loving. You know, here's because here's the thing. It's not just by what comes out of our mouth that makes us distinct. Jesus said that people will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love. And the way that... Uh, uh, much, much more of the time, you notice you feel loved and valued and accepted when someone's listening, not just speaking. And so we can love and show love to people as we listen, but also not just listening. We need to speak the truth, but listen in a way to find those inroads. Find where, where can I share something? Where, where's there some, those longings that have been talked about over the last couple of weeks? Where, where are their hurts? Where are their wrong beliefs about, about what God is like and about what Christianity is all about? We need to have salty speech, salty ears, and also we need to have salty actions. Matthew 5 talked about uncovering the light. Don't cover it with a basket or a bowl, but set it on a stand. And in verse 16, it says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine. Let them shine out for all to see. So, so that what? So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. That we are called to be living in a way that pricks people's attention, that makes it, there's something salty about the way they, there's something distinct and different about, about us. Um, I wanna share one of my mistakes. I make lots of mistakes in this area, um, but well-intentioned well mistakes. And, and one of those was in um, a previous workplace where a, a work colleague of mine, it's probably important that I mention that this wasn't the church, um, for reasons I'm about to show you, but in an education set, setting, the, the person in the office next door had an absolute potty mouth. I mean, they, she had, the, 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 some of the things she said would, would, would shocked me. And, and so like, I, I mean, I, I'm okay, I can, I can deal with that. But then it was like, wow, there, there are kids around. There are, there are students around. And, and, so, and so I thought, all right, the, I'm, I'm gonna say something here. And, and so I, I started a swear jar. I thought, I'm not gonna just tell her off and say, please, please don't use that language for my, my uh, pure Christian ears. I said, I started a swear jar to try and make light of it. And I'm like, when I, whenever I hear some language from the office next door, I'm like, swear jar, put some money in the jar. And, and so, but after a while of doing this, I reflect on, I'm like, is this really being salt and light in my workplace? Is this really the message about Jesus Christ that I wanna be getting across? Am I really doing what I'm called to be doing? And the answer was no. Because here's the thing, what I was, I was it was I'm like, people don't get point to Jesus because I'm being the moral police. People don't fall in love with Jesus by me, by them thinking that they, they are, that I'm, pure and holy and they're not. Because instead of, see the, the thing here was, let your good deeds shine for all to see, not so that you'll end up looking really upright and excellent. It says, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And so we, we need to be so careful not to be playing the moral police. I'm like, yes, we are held to a higher standard. Yes, we have convictions and a sensitive conscience and we wanna be living in a way that is righteous and obedient and pure. And, we, and God calls us to be holy and the commands are there for us to live by. Um, and God's laid the, as a blueprint for us, but we need to be really careful that we're not leading with those things that are applicable to us, but not immediately applicable to those other people. We need to be so careful that we're not the ones who end up getting the glory. Rather than that, we need to be living 
in a way that is full of grace. And I think, well, I think what, what kind of things could I be doing? Because I, I mean, people do a lot of good things in our world. And I think there's times where I do good things that don't get people's attention. They just think, Sam, you're really, you know, give me a pat on the back. They think you're a nice person. I think, and I think that's okay. In those moments, you don't need to say, oh, glory to God. You know, um, I, I, you know, put the bins out for my neighbours. I'm like, oh, this, you know, glory unto Jesus. We don't need to be weird like that. We can, we, can, we can say, hey, thank you for the encouragement, but it's like, I'm not out to try and make myself look good because that is not what's gonna point people to Jesus. Um, in Acts 4, in the passage that was used last week, I think here, here is a key. Here is a key to people noticing God in us. It says this, when they, the council, saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they won't, they weren't amazing, they weren't impressive, they were what? They were unschooled, ordinary men. Isn't that an encouragement for someone? If you feel, is there anyone ordinary here today? Any of you who don't imagine anything, I, I've won 10 or 20 people to Christ this week. I'm like, oh, we, are, we are pretty ordinary. But God is in the business of using ordinary people, unschooled people, unqualified people who are on a journey of walking with Jesus. And they said they were astonished at what was working through them and what they were doing with Jesus. But here's the key. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. Wow, isn't that helpful for us? It's it's not about us making ourselves look impressive, holding everyone to the same moral standard that we have. It's about taking time to be with Jesus. Let His grace pervade our life. And I wanna share this because what people should see is obviously sacrificial love that's different from the world. I'm like, why would you do that? That actually incurred a level of suffering for you and it didn't make you, it actually, it put you backwards. It didn't, it didn't make you, it didn't elevate you, but that, that's what we're talking about. And I think a way that I wanted to talk about today, which I think we see in the, the Scripture from the Apostle Paul, is that we need to be so careful about making ourselves look good in the eyes of others, because I think we can try and be salt and light, but end up looking pretty good ourselves as we're doing it. That people can end up thinking, oh man, Sam, you're, look, you're, a, you're a really good guy. You're pretty amazing. I, I wanna be like you. But it's not meant to be about us, it's meant to be us pointing people to Jesus. But I think the way and the key to doing this is by, my next point, it's by freely sharing our failure. Because just like my friend the barber had the assumption, I think most people had this, it's like surely good people will go to heaven. They had this paradigm of what Christianity is all about and who it's for and what's required. But as we share our failures, not just our past failures and hey, I haven't got my life all together, but not only that, since I've been forgiven, since I've been walking with Jesus, I've received His grace, but hey, now I still need His grace. Now I still stuff up all the time. Now I still have doubts all the time. But the message of the gospel is that it wasn't about earning and deserving. It was about a free gift of what Jesus has done, of the life He has lived, that His life was worthy, not mine. And we start to break down the thinking about what religion and Christianity is all about. And it's not by doing all the good things that necessarily make people get to that point, but actually sharing our failures. Sharing our failures, because that starts to show how good God is. Even when we are not, God is so good. And that's our testimony. That's what the story that we should be sharing is that, no, 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 no. I'm not good at all. I, I'm, I'm the worst of sinners, but my God is so good. And because all of a sudden people can identify with that. People can identify with being broken. People can identify with being far from God. And then they can think, wow, that is what love is all about. That is beautiful. We need to be so careful not to put the focus on ourselves as the messengers, as being wonderful, but have the focus on the message. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, I love this. It talks about the role and the part that we have 
and how we play it, the humility. It says this, but we have this treasure, the, me- the message of the gospel. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. See, it's, we need to be really careful as we share our failings and we remember that I am like that jar or the, the pot made of earthenware, which is just clay, a clay pot. An ordinary clay pot would have been found in every single household in Jesus' day. In fact, we hear about the potter's field, which was the field that was there full of all these broken pottery pieces because it was, these things were so common. And so the message is to come in something very common. It's not about the messenger. The messenger, you and me, is very ordinary. Nothing beautiful, attractive about it. Praise God, I mean, I mean that with all due respect. But there's the treasure. There's the treasure. It's about the treasure. And it's like, that's where we, as we share, we need to be careful not to make ourselves look good and think that, hey, we're doing Jesus a favour by saying, oh yeah, here's all the good things that I do. You know, like letting, we can't let people think that. We need people to see Jesus, His goodness, in spite of our ordinariness. The Apostle Paul continues. This is a whole theme of the book of 2 Corinthians where he talks about the weak and the strong and, and the, the, the power and, and how the message is passed on. And in this famous passage where he talks about the thorn in his flesh, the thing that bugs him. And he says, but he, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Notice how it all comes together. Notice where, where the good stuff comes. For my power is made perfect in weakness, in weakness. So it's like the, it's like the pottery and the treasure. It's saying, hey, as, as the, the ordinariness of the pottery, there's something about that dynamic, the ordinariness makes the treasure more spectacular. Because if we're bejeweling the 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 clay pot, it's gonna take the attention and the contrast away from how amazing the gospel is. So Paul was driven, Paul was motivated to lowering himself and putting the emphasis not on how, he, how good he was. And because here's the thing we miss, he talks about the foolishness of the gospel and he talks about he boasting in weakness. But here's the thing, Paul was a flippin' genius. He was one of the most brilliant minds of history. Let's not lose that. So he's not saying, it's not anti-intellectual that we're not gonna get involved with apologetics. We're not gonna study up. We're not gonna exegete culture. And that is to know how, what culture thinks, what, what they value so that we can speak. We need to be studying. We need, we need to be as smart as we possibly can about how we have conversations about Jesus. But that's not where the power comes from. And that's certainly not what we're pointing people to. We're pointing people to Jesus. And I want people to see that I am so ordinary, but I wanna see that God is extraordinary. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more glad, gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may, may rest upon me. For that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And we can, we can miss the significance of what Paul is doing here. Paul is a giant. As I just said, Paul is a giant. He's an intellectual giant. And in Paul's day and in the Roman age, the custom was that he's speaking into is that there, there was um, philosophy and the sophists of the time, there would be, they would, they would when, when the visiting speakers and intellectuals came into town, people would flock in. That would be like the entertainment. People, to use a young person's phrase, the people frothed it. They loved it. And so that, and they would, they would love the, the eloquent words and, and the, the piecing together, using human language to sound impressive. And, and so not only that was the custom that they would seek to wow them and people would attribute um, truth and worth to, to that kind of speaking alone. But also in Roman culture, um, that you would kind of, the first thing you'd do to announce yourself, you would say, I am Pastor Sam Chesser. And then they would list off all of their accomplishments. This was normal practice. And that this would be how you'd kind of set 
um, set the stage and to, for people to let you know that you are someone who has status and worth and someone worth listening to. And so anyone who got up to speak would actually list off all of those things that people would think, okay, this, this person is legitimate. And so Paul is flipping this on its head and see, so this boasting, he's saying, hey, this is, he's so clever in, in how he's brilliant, see? And he says, I'm gonna boast. And it's like a reverse boasting that he boasts about the insults. He boasts about his imprisonment, about being shipwrecked. All these things that would have been the opposite, would have been shameful in his culture. He's saying, I'm gonna boast, this is my credentials. This is what I'm laying out before you. I don't want any of you to think that I'm impressive. I want you to see that Jesus is impressive. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We need to get out of the way. We need to get out of the way. We need to be happy to be insignificant, ordinary, unschooled people who allow ourselves to be used by God, like the Apostle Paul. I might invite the band to come as we respond. Um, in, just share this before we close. In, um, when we moved into our house nearly 10 years ago, um, there were some changes we wanted to make and the previous owners in our, as soon as you walk through our house, they'd made, made it into a four bedroom house and they'd put up a couple of walls. And so you'd, you'd walk in and there'd be these gross, um, win, it was like a window wall, I don't know, mirror, mirror wall, um, yeah, mirror wall. And it was like, I guess that was cool in the 70s when our house was kind of built. And they made this little study but on the other side of the study, there was this, this beautiful, huge window that was going out into the, to the natural environment where there was um, native trees, shrubs, and there'd be native birds that would sort of congregate in that area. And, and that was, we were just so motivated and think, what, what have they done to this house? There was, there was two walls that were separating that space. And so what we decided to do is to knock out those walls. And as soon as we knocked out those walls, it became a beautiful space. The walls were separating anybody from seeing the beauty that was in the outdoor space. So now when you come through our house, as soon as you walk in, you look to the side and there's just, oh wow, the light just flows in. You can see that beautiful natural environment. And I think, man, this was, that's the picture that God gave me of what He's wanting to do today, that there are some walls that are actually put up that, that we have allowed up in our lives that, that are surrounding us like the basket that's actually getting in the way of God's glory shining through. That there are some things that we need to knock down. There's some things that we need to stop doing. There's, there's some things that need to be removed that make us feel a little bit weak so that His power can rest on us, so that His light can shine out. And that as we do those things, it's gonna make us feel a little bit vulnerable. And I think that for me and what the Lord was speaking to me about is like, Sam, you're, you're too worried about what people think about you. You've got too much fear about losing a good reputation. And the Lord was saying, that's a, that's a wall, you're putting up a wall that wall can come down. As, you, as that wall comes down, people are gonna see me. People are gonna see me. That light's gonna come through. You may look worse in the eyes of people. You might look a little bit foolish, but it gives me an opportunity for people to look at me. Why don't we stand together? In the particular area, as we talked about being salty, salty words, salty is salty actions. Felt the particular area we, he wanted to minister to some people was around the fear of what other people will think. Cultivating a, an image and a reputation, maintaining looking good in the eyes of others. But in doing so, we're stopping the light, the truth, the beauty of Jesus, the message of grace, that seasoning with salt to be able to come through. Is that you here today? Let me invite you to respond in a moment.
But Proverbs 29 says this, fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man is a snare. As we're worried so much about what other people think of us, we can't truly be who God has called us to be. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please people? And if I was trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The Lord is calling us to drop those walls. Lay aside our pride and humbly say, Lord, I wanna, like the Apostle Paul, I don't want my credibility to be the thing that I'm holding up. I don't want all my good deeds to be the thing that people see and notice and celebrate about me. I want you to shine through in my life. And I know that that's not gonna fully happen until I lay myself down. I said, Lord, whatever it takes, however foolish I look, I want you to use me, Lord, even if people think I'm a bit silly, even if people think I'm a bit backwards, even if I step out and take a chance. But I want, I want that to be my reality. And so as we, let's just, let's just pray together. And would you join with me as we allow the words to soak in, as we allow the Holy Spirit to have precedence in our life. Father, we thank You that, that Your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace is sufficient. Lord, it is Your grace, it is Your gospel of grace that is the good news. It is the thing that is worth sharing. It is the thing that is salty. It is the thing that makes people thirsty. It is the thing that makes, that illuminates and makes things beautiful. It's not the fact that I am good in of myself, but it is because of Your grace towards me in times of my failings. It's because I didn't deserve it. Lord, it is Your grace that has the power to save. And so Lord, we just wanna drop the curtains, drop the walls, drop the pride, drop the fear and the anxiety, drop the fear of man, drop the desire to be impressive in the eyes of others. Lord, I thank You just that story of, of the choosing and the appointing and the anointing of King David, you went, you looked at all the oldest brothers, the, the ones that looked like kings, that you went throughout the line. It wasn't the most impressive, it wasn't the strongest, it wasn't, it was David, the one that was the least likely. Said, the man looks at the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Lord, we thank You that all throughout, since the, the beginning of the Bible, that You used the weak things to shame the strong, that You used the small and insignificant things to make the difference, to point people to You, that You used Gideon, who was the least and the weakest clan, the least in his father's house, that you chose him to bring a mighty victory, that you chose a teenage virgin girl to bear your son, that you chose a stumbling, bumbling man of Moses to bring the greatest victory and deliverance out of Egypt. Lord, there are so many people throughout the Bible that used people who didn't, weren't impressive to carry your message, to point people towards you so that we, so that people wouldn't glorify us, that people would say, wow, God is so good. And Lord, today we allow ourselves to become small in your eyes, not just to feel small, not just to be humbled, but to then have great faith that you continue to choose the weak things of the world, the insignificant things for your power to rest and for your power to flow. And I thank You, Lord, that today You are calling us, Your people, to carry Your flame, to carry Your fire, to carry the good news of grace, 
to say, I am a failure, but my God is a God who lifts us up. Our God is a God who brings beauty out of the ashes and who calls enemies friends. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord.